So, um, it is my pleasure uh, today to introduce Dr. Daniel Quintana. He's a senior researcher in psychology at the University of Oslo. So his research primarily investigate how our hormones and cardiovascular system influence our thoughts and behavior using a variety of research approaches. So he's also interested in meta science, which is an emerging discipline that aims to evaluate and improve the quality of scientific research. So his name might sound familiar to you, uh, as he's also a passionate science communicator and has appeared on multiple podcasts. He's a producer and co-host of Everything Hurts, and he also hosts the Physiology and Behavior podcast. Today, as part of uh, this year's first UEA reproducibility, uh, he will be introducing the concept of synthetic data sets, which is an emerging method originally developed to permit the sharing of confidential census data. So um, without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Daniel Quintana. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the very, very kind introduction. I'll get my slides up and we'll get uh, we'll get started with the talk. OK. OK, let's uh, let's get rolling. So for the for the next little while, I'm going to be talking about how we can use synthetic data sets to increase data sharing, um, which has a, a lot of utility and a lot of use, while at the same time also ma maintaining participant privacy, which is a really important consideration when it comes to sharing our work and sharing our data. Now, perhaps I'm speaking to the choir here, but uh, there is indeed a reproducibility crisis in a lot of different research areas, the psychological sciences, the biomedical sciences. We've seen the, re re the reproducibility efforts within psychology at least, and uh, efforts to, to reproduce a lot of key results haven't been entirely successful. It's been exactly the same thing when it comes to cancer biology. There was the, um, the, the, the Cancer Biology re Reproducibility Project, which was published last year, and that found um, less than half of, uh, of, of, of a set of important findings within cancer biology did not reproduce. So we're having a, a lot of issues here within uh, irreducible research, and researchers have been surveyed as to what they believe to be the important factors that contribute to, in, in, uh, to, to reproducible or irre, irreproducible research. And there, there's a number of factors that do contribute, but one thing I want to talk about is this idea of not having your, your data available, because not having your data available or not being able to actually replicate what people have reported is a very important part of how we actually tackle reproducibility. So there are various risks for open data. Um, I mean, firstly, there's a lot of benefits. Open data provides a lot of utility for science, society, and the economy. And I think one of the main benefits is that firstly, you're able to verify results and generate new knowledge. Uh, a couple of days ago, I got an email from some uh, some researchers who were using a tool that I'm currently developing or currently piloting. And they're like, can you have a look at my paper? And because their data was posted online, I was actually able to get a really solid understanding of what they were doing with their analysis. Science done the traditional way does not post data. So it's very difficult to actually understand what people have done. But uh, another benefit is that having open data can actually help generate new knowledge. You may have a good idea of what you want to do for your research. Uh, you post your data, but another researchers might come along going, hey, based on the data that we have, here's a very, here's a really interesting hypothesis. And this open data can be used for hypothesis generation. I think it's really important to stress that uh, science, or at least a lot of the science that we do, is, is both uh, hypothesis testing and also hypothesis generating. We can't just focus on the hypothesis generation, uh, hypothesis testing, because if we don't if we don't focus on hypothesis generation, then we have nothing to test. So both sides are very important. But by having open data, um, particularly around um, research, which is hypothesis testing, we can actually generate new hypotheses based on this data. And this is a really good. Uh, really good use of resources. There's an incredible amount of, of research waste within the biomedical sciences where people will get a lot of people get funding to 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 do research or they're they're, they're devoting a lot of personnel hours to do research. and the the the, the data is not being we're not fulfilling the, the potential of the data. 
that by having open data, we can do additional hypothesis testing. We can verify. Uh, we can generate new knowledge, and we can form. We can't. We can form new hypotheses, um, which is which is a, a really big benefit of having open data. But at the same time, we need to consider participant privacy. There's there's often a lot of discussion. There is a lot of discussion, in fact, around having open data, and uh, it can become very clear as to some people's research disciplines when they talk about open data. Because some people are like, yeah, just post your data. It's very easy. But these are people who might not necessarily be working with rare or vulnerable populations. If you're working in, in animal research, or if you're working with data that's not necessarily sensitive, um, you know, perceptual psychology, to, to use an example, reaction time data, for instance. Um, that sort of data is not necessarily sensitive, so it is relatively straightforward to post data, which doesn't necessarily need uh, demographic information, without risking participant privacy. So there's there, there's diff different things to consider here. So we have this idea that open data has a lot of benefits, but at the same time, we do need to consider participant privacy. This is a very important consideration because if the public loses trust in their uh, in in the data that, that they're participating in they're not going to participate in, in in our future studies we need to take this stuff very very seriously so we have this we have this sort of ideal this this contrast between utility or how we can use data but also disclosure protection or participant privacy so with open data we've got very high utility we can get a lot of use out of it but there's little disclosure protection but if we have closed data that basically guarantees that we that we preserve the the the, the privacy of research participants but there's little utility so we, there's a bit of a there's a bit of a contrast there um now there's there's been a few approaches in order to actually think about well how do we share our data while maintaining participant privacy um some early approaches have been well, let's just remove their names <laughs> I, hope, I hope you're doing this um addresses and national id numbers this is the first thing of course you're going to kind of, you, you're going to do this you want to remove as much information as possible but even if you keep things such as age um such as um you know where, where people live uh, people, it's relatively straightforward in many circumstances to actually identify who these people are if you present enough data. So by removing identifiers that you think, oh, if we remove this, they're never going to find out. It's still not a, a full, a foolproof way of of sharing your data. Another approach is aggregating sensitive variables. Um, in many cases, you don't need to provide a continuous measure of age. It may, maybe it's maybe it's very it's a, it's very important for your research question, but in if it's purely a demographic variable, you can simply say that there was twenty people aged between eighteen and and thirty, for instance. There are ways that you can do this um, in order to actually reduce risk, but at the same time, this is at the expense of utility. Perhaps somebody in the future wants to have a look at your data, generate some new hypotheses, or try and reproduce your analysis, but if your data is binned, it's not going to give them the same amount of precision. So there are positives and there are negatives. Other approaches have been um, adding random noise to the data set as well. This has been tried, but again, um, people have been able to reverse engineer and actually figure out and uh, reveal the identities of individuals, even when this random noise has been added to the data set. So the question is, can we increase utility while at the same time maintaining participant privacy and yes the answer is yes we can do that with synthetic data and this is a new data set which mimics the original data set by preserving the statistical properties and relationships between variables so with synthetic data you can get the best of both worlds um, it's not quite open data because you're not dealing with the raw data that was originally co um, collected uh, but at the same time you're getting a lot of disclosure protection as well, so um, although you're not getting the raw data, you're you're, you're protecting the privacy of, of your participants because your data set or your synthetic data set, every synthetic person, no synthetic person represents a real person. It's impossible to actually figure out who is who because the data is 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 scrambled. So here's an example here. Say you have a data set with a number of um, uh, categorical and continuous variables. With your synthetic data set, you can actually um, recreate the data, and if you were to run the same sort of uh, summary statistics, you would get very, very similar results. If in this case, the, the, the proportions of males and females, the average age or the standard deviation of the age, 
um, and the, the, these other variables here as well. But what's more important is that the relationships between these variables remain the same. So for instance, if we saw that there was a relationship between um, uh, between income and, and education in the original data set, you would see the same relationship within the synthetic data set. This is very, very key and synthetic data can maintain these relationships. Now, the benefit here is that you can reproduce the analysis. So if you're working with very sensitive data and you can you, you can argue you can argue in your paper look we have a sensitive population here but at the same time we would we would we want to give other people the opportunity to reproduce um, the analysis you can present your synthetic data and then people can get a result which is very which is the same but it felt the same very very close to your original data so people can actually um, recreate your analysis using the synthetic data set others can explore the data and generate new hypotheses and by and still here the disclosure risk is essentially zero. Now I say essentially zero because right now um, that there is there's no way to actually figure it out. It's hard to predict what's going to happen in the future. But right now there's there's no way to actually identify people based on this synthetic data. So it's not all uh, beer and skittles, as, as we say in Australia. Maybe it's the same as in the UK. There are two conditions that increase disclosure risk. One is replicated set of values. So. Um, depending on the type of data that you have originally, there might be, um, if you only have a few different, um, say, say you have three or four different variables and these are categorical variables, it might be um, somebody might recognize themselves in the data set. Uh, so under some circumstances, it's you're not able to actually create a synthetic data set where, where, where not one synthetic person actually represents a real person. Another thing is extreme individual values. So say you're dealing with a rare population, maybe you're working with prisoners who have been convic convicted of violent crimes. Um, in, in Norway, there's not many of them. If you're doing research on them and one of them happens to be 80, you know who that person is. So if there's somebody in your data set who has an extreme individual value, and usually age is, is one example, then that is one way to identify a particular person. So in the original data, if that person is, is 80, in the synthetic data, they might be 81 or 79 or 78, for instance. Uh, but still, regardless, if there's one extreme person, you're able to you're able to identify them. So there are ways around this, um, but I want to note that it's not all positive. There are there are two conditions here that, that that are thought to increase disclosure risk with synthetic data. So how do we do this? We we do this with the excellently named synth pop package, which stands for synthetic populations. Here is the original paper describing it. Um, I came across this because I was I was trying to solve this for my own research. I was trying to think how can I share my how can I share the data my, my data while still maintaining um, participant privacy because as, as I work with a, a relatively rare population, um, which is is which is quite small around Oslo and uh, and Norway. So I came across this and I thought. This is fantastic. This has been used within census data. Census data is, 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 is very sensitive. Uh, you can identify people very easily. Um, so a lot of places, including within the UK and a lot of other, a lot of other countries have used this. So researchers can actually go in and do analysis on census data while still maintaining the privacy of, of people um, who, who, who are included within the data set. Um, and at the time when I started looking at this, very few people within within psychology at least or within the biomedical sciences that actually use this um now it's become a lot more popular which i think is great um but uh yeah this package facilitates this use of creating synthetic data so i'm going to walk you through how to do this um this is part I've, I've written a tutorial paper on how to do this within r um if you're a beginner to r I think you'll be able to do this. It's not too complicated. Um, and if you don't use R, I would highly recommend, particularly if you're going to continue in academia, to, to, to put the investment in and to invest time into learning R. Uh, but regardless, uh, you only need um, relatively like beginner to beginner to intermediate skills in R to be able to do this. The main workhorse of the synthpop, synthpop package is the syn function. So what this does is this replaces all or some of the data by sampling from a probability distribution. So think of it like it operates much in the same way of like multiple imputation. And it uses the, uh, the CART or the classification and re regression tree procedure in order to do this. Now, there are two types of utility 
or two types of things to consider when you have your open data. General utility, so that is, is are there overall similarities in the data set? Um, so this is sort of testing, do, um, are the averages the same? Is the variance the same? Are the relationships between the variables the same? So this is important for data exploration. But the second factor is specific utility. And this comes back to, to the idea of can others reproduce the analysis? So essentially how similar are fitted models? So say you're, you're running a t-test or you're running a, a linear regression or, or what have you. If you run that regression in your synthetic data, how similar is it to the results you get from the real data? So these are two important considerations for when you are creating and reporting your synthetic data. Is there high general utility? Is there similarities between the data set as on a whole? And is there high specific utility? So how similar are the outcomes or, 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 the, or the analysis? So, you know, for, for a typical paper, you may have a number of uh, primary outcomes or some, some important outcomes that you're reporting. You want to check if you're sharing your synthetic data and you, the, and you can report that there is high utility, that the, um, the, the models that you're fitting with the synthetic data are very similar to the models that you get with the original data. So for my tutorial paper, um, I, I do a lot of work with oxytocin. It's a, it's a hormone which is primarily produced in the brain, um, which is thought to play a role. I mean, it's long known to play a role in, in birth and, and breastfeeding, but more recently, researchers have begun to investigate its, it, its role in a whole bunch of psychological uh, phenomena. And one thing which has been looked at is whether it increases the feelings of spirituality. Um, this data set was open, credit to the researchers. And I wanted to look at the, the, the general and the specific utility of this particular data set as a demonstration. So this is the this is the um, this is the data or the analyses that are used as as a demonstration within my tutorial paper. So when we compare the observed data, which is light blue, and the synthetic data, which is dark blue, we can see the counts between the people that were randomised to the condition. That's OT condition. They're they're, they're pretty similar. We can look at the distribution of age, and we can see you know it's not exactly the same, but it's similar. Um, we can look at this measure of spirituality uh, between the observed and synthetic data sets, so we can see there are similarities there. And another question that they were asked within this analysis was, um, are you religiously affiliated? And again, we can see that uh, the, when creating the synthetic data, these counts were, were very similar. So this that's, that's a tick for, for, for general utility. Now, in order to test specific utility for this particular package, you need to convert your analysis into a linear model. So one of the main outcomes within this paper was a t-test with the, the most common test within psychology I read a couple of weeks ago. Um, now, this this blew my mind when I, when, I, when, I, when I figured this out, and I can't believe I didn't know this during undergraduate or postgraduate statistics training in that every single common test is actually a linear model in disguise you can convert every single test into, into a linear model. So having this, um, converting your analysis into a, in, into a linear model um, isn't too tricky because that is, um, that, that's essentially what it is. Uh, I know a lot, of, a lot of schools are actually teaching things as linear models first and then um, doing teaching things like t-tests and ANOVAs later. Um, I'm not sure, but regardless, in order for you to test specific utility, you do need to convert your analyses into a, into a linear model. Um, check out this, this fantastic guide for some, some common tests and how to, actually, how to actually do this. So I did this and I looked at some of the main outcome measures and uh, converted them to linear models. Uh, if, if, yeah, I think I did that for all of them. And then you simply compare the, um, the, 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 the effect and, and the variance. So here we can see the synthetic data and the observed data for uh, seeing if there was a, a, a difference in, um, in conditions that's very, very similar. Um, spirit, the, the spirituality measure or spirituality coefficient, uh, a little bit of difference, but still quite similar. And then this is a, uh, a model which included, which included two coefficients, which is panel D, and we can see some similarities there. So here, at least eyeballing it, we can see that there is high specific utility, but there are ways that you can use statistical inference to, to help make your decisions as to whether there is high specific utility. So for now, um, there's no sort of inference that you can use for general, general utility other than, hey, it, look, it looks pretty good, but for specific utility, there are tests that you can do to actually see whether there is high specific utility there. Um, okay, so within this example, Fortunately, there was no replicated data sets, which meant that every single synthetic person 
was not a match, did not match with any real person. There was good general utility. And we're looking at, so we can do a lack of a lack of fit test to, to compare the models generated here. And we can see for this particular test, this wasn't statistically significant. Um, we can also do a test of differences between the synthetic and original data. Um, and we can simply look at the overlap of the confidence intervals as well. So here, there was, there was, a, there was a pretty high overlap between these, um, so almost 90% confidence interval overlap uh, yeah and this and it was it was quite similar for, for, for both the for both the coefficients as well so we can be fairly confident that this particular finding had high specific utility so what this means if you were doing this in practice you would say okay we're, we're working with this with a sensitive population and uh, we uh, report our synthetic data and we, we would also like to state that this is um, that you, you you report these findings it has high um, general utility and high specific utility. Whether you want to put this in your main paper or as a supplement is up to you, but at least you can demonstrate that if other people, A, want to replicate your findings, they can do so, and B, if they want to explore your data, they are going to get relatively um, similar results as if they were working with the real data. Uh, I, I was curious when I was working with this as to how this would perform under different conditions. Um, <laughs> It's funny that the data that I used to work with in undergraduate psychology, it was perfect. There was no missingness. It wasn't skewed. There were, there were nice, you know, sample sizes of 50 or 100. And that's just not the reality of data. Data is messy. There's missing data. There's skew. So I wanted to see how synthetic data performed under different um, different conditions, uh, whether there was some skew or missing data or a lot of missing data. And um, generally speaking, it performs quite well, depending on um, e even if you have a fair bit of missing data as well. So that was just a nice demonstration. Now I simulated a number of different data sets, uh, which included these different parameters. Uh, you can try this for yourself, even if you are not super confident with R, uh, what I've done is I've created a um, uh, um, this thing, it's basically an online website where you can go and you can load R in your website without even having R installed on your computer. Um, and then you can recreate everything. You don't have to worry about whether you have the right R version or the right package version. This this essentially took a screenshot or this, this, this took a, like a time machine of my computer when I created this analysis. And you can go through and, and, and you can do all this. So you can either use the data that I have or you can enter in your own data and use the same code. And you can see this for yourself. So if you go to my uh, GitHub page, you can follow the links and you can perform this this analysis for yourself just to see how relatively straightforward it is. Um, I think I think it's worth saying that we, a lot of researchers, at least, at least I did, we kind of assume that nobody wants their data shared, even if you remove identifiable information, that people don't want their data shared. But when you actually ask people, are you okay with us sharing your data if we, if we remove all, all reasonable information that you can be identified with, the majority of people actually are, are okay with this. Pe people don't participate in research for the money. <laughs> that's, 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 that's one purpose of our local institutional review boards is that we can't we can't pay our participants too much because they're not they're, they're doing it to contribute, not necessarily to make money. They want to contribute to 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 research, especially if you're working with clinical populations. So the ideal thing that the, the better approach is to ask people's permission at the very beginning if it's okay to share data. But this is not. This is not necessarily the case, but the point I'm trying to make here is that don't just assume that people don't want to share their data. If you ask them, then perhaps you can you can avoid doing all this, 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 this synthetic uh, data creation, and you can post your 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 um, raw data anyway. I think synthetic data is very exciting because because it can help solve two of the most common but valid objections. Uh, I've talked a lot about participant privacy. But the second thing is this idea of um, a lot of people don't want to share their data because they, they might say, well, we've we'll, we'll spent a, we'll a couple of years doing this analysis, a lot of resources, a lot of money, and my first PhD student has done the analysis, but I want to keep this, I want to keep this data and not post it because I've got three more PhD students and they want to they analyze the data and we've got plenty more outcomes to come. And I, can't, I, 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 do, I do appreciate that. Research can be expensive, and if you're putting all this work in, um, you know I can understand. I don't necessarily agree, but I can understand how you you want you want first dibs on particular data. Uh, synthetic data can can help solve this because by posting your data, 
other people can still do the analysis, but they can't, they're not necessarily, they're definitely not going to publish data because it's not real. It's a synthetic version, which is going to give you a very, very close approximation. But that sort of, that very close approximation is not sufficient for publication on in, in itself. So one potential scenario is that researchers can post their synthetic data other people can do their analysis and they can say, hey, I ran analysis on your synthetic data. I found this 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 really interesting finding. Um, can you verify and can we can, can we can we work together? And because you're the one that holds the, 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 the raw data, you can actually choose, hey, I can we can run this analysis and then we can work together. So you're sharing. So you're still sharing your data so that other people can generate hypothesis and verify the work that you've done. But you're not giving away your data to the point where other people can 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 use it and potentially uh, use it before your your other team members can as well. So that's one potential advantage of of, of doing that. The other people can still verify their data, but if you're planning on having additional outcomes from the data set. Uh, then, then you still have control of the raw data. So, it 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 partially solves that problem, I think. So we have this this fantastic solution that uh, synthetic data can provide the utility of open data, so others can verify your analysis and generate new hypotheses, while at the same time maintaining disclosure control. In terms of utility, uh, open data is is always the way to go. It's 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 much better because you're dealing with with you're dealing with real data, um, but uh, but a synthetic data set is is better than than, than no data at all. Um, I want to reiterate some of the limitations again, and that for some data sets, with, with the data sets that I've worked with, um, I've had I've had good success, and the data sets that that colleagues have worked with, they've had good success. But some people have written to me going, oh, I've I've tried it, but but I, I can't quite get it to work, and this is sometimes going to happen, especially when you have a very few variables within your data set because uh, it can be very difficult to to not replicate a synthetic person or not replicate a real person as a synthetic person. Um, so there are there are some circumstances where you might not be able to generate a synthetic data set with acceptable utility. Um, there are ways that you can try and improve this, for instance. So if you when you're actually running your analysis by default, this analysis runs and it uses the first variable in your data set as the seed, so to speak, and everything is run off that. Some people have had success with changing what the first variable is. Um, that, that, that can potentially help. Uh, another limitation is when it comes to specific utility, uh, you can only directly compare linear models. Um, yeah, yeah for, for, most, for most research questions, you can, if you're using traditional tests, you can actually convert your, your work to a, to a linear model, um, but in some circumstances, this, this is not possible. It still means that you can um, you can uh, still share your synthetic data and you still have good uh, general utility, but you can't necessarily test specific utility, at least using the package. Uh, I mean, th th there, there would be ways to do this with, with a bit of work, but within the package, uh, the package expects linear models, but maybe there'll be an update in the future, I'm not sure. Um, and yeah, in, in some circumstances, risk of, di of disclosure can increase. So these are the cases, especially when you have um, outliers within your data set, which can make individuals easier to identify. So some, some take home messages with synthetic data. Um, this by synthetic data can improve reproducibility and hypothesis generation. Uh, we have a situation where it's very difficult to share data or it has been traditionally difficult to share data. Privacy has been an issue. But this offers a way around that because people cannot be identified within a synthetic data set. This is, the disclosure risk is limited, like I just said, and this is relatively easy to implement within the synthpop package. Have a read of the paper. I specifically wrote it for people who don't who might not necessarily have a strong familiar, familiarity with R, um, and go through that. Use the uh, use the test data sets, and then after that, you have a play around with your own data. See how you go with 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 creating this. It's it's, it's if, if your data set is you know a, a typical data set within the biomedical sciences or uh, within the social sciences, then it takes about it, it takes a couple of seconds for, for for you to actually do that. I've tried this with with large um, uh, brain imaging data sets. It takes a little bit longer, um, but I would uh, just just try it for yourself. Get your data set. And, uh, and 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 run synthpop using the instructions um, both within the original paper but also within within the tutorial paper that I've written and and see what you can do with creating synthetic data sets uh, I want to have some time for some for some questions so yeah let, let, let's chat now um, if, if you, you want you could also send me an email as well 
if you have questions afterwards, but um, let's take the opportunity now to to have some questions and uh, I, I thank you all for, for your attention. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, that was very interesting, fascinating, and uh, you foresaw my question because I was about uh, to ask you, so what What would be the key takeaway messages? <laughs> <laughs> good, good. <laughs> yeah, your slide was very helpful. So there is one question in the chat. Actually, there is more than one. So uh, from Amy, I think, uh, what was the GitHub page? She was asking about the GitHub page number, I think. Ah, uh, okay. Um, let me see if I can uh, if I can find that. Um, yeah, we have other questions as well. So. Yeah, perhaps we can. Um, what while? Yeah, we can get other questions while I'm. Um, Excellent. Quickly. Yeah. Um, so Marina uh, is asking. Uh, she's first of all uh, commanding uh, on your great talk and thanking you for that. Uh, it's really clear how important reproducibility is in science and the benefits of it. But how do we actually incentivize people to be more open with their data sets? Maybe journals should make sharing data uh, data sets and synthetic data sets mandatory. Ooh. What do you think? <laughs> I, I, I like this idea. We do, whether we like it or not, I think incentives do change the behavior of researchers. Um, I'm very much for this idea that we should be rewarding researchers, um, making stuff mandatory. It's hard to to foresee that the, there might be situations where this simply isn't practical. So in some instances, if you're dealing with smaller data sets, it's just not possible to share a synthetic data set. Um, I think there are other things that you can do, for instance. So um, one idea that I like is that, you know, researchers should have their data available. So if somebody actually asks, hey, I'd like to verify your analysis, they can actually they they can actually do it because we know that the success rates of actually asking a researcher when they say data is available upon request isn't very high. I, th I think only 20% of researchers actually provide data for, ve for various reasons. So I think journals should at least, I mean, there are various proposals that perhaps researchers could actually, um, in confidence, share the data to editors going, hey, the data is here. So if somebody wants to um, request it, then at least it, it is available. But I think we should strongly encourage and strongly reward researchers to do this. Um, but I'm not quite sure yet about making it mandatory because it doesn't work in all situations. But look, I think it's very important for for research funders to to reward this, to 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 um, to make this as to make the, the sharing of data as as, as much as possible a, a part of their research funding. And it's also it's also critical for institutions to also um, to also work towards rewarding this kind of stuff when it comes to new positions and when it comes to promotion and these kind of things of of um, of uh, reproducible and open science practices, but it's because research fields are very different and diverse. I'm a little bit hesitant towards um, towards making these kind of things mandatory. And look, in in, in my experience of, of of doing these kind of talks, a lot of people equate open science with open data. So as soon as you say, "Oh, there's this someone coming doing an open science talk," they're like, "I can't share my data." Um, rare populations, and then they're not even familiar with synthetic data sets. I think it's important to, to really stress that open data is just one part of open science. So the goal is to make one part a, 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 a little bit easier. So hopefully we can incentivize this kind of stuff. And look, I think one reward is that if you're sharing your data, people are going to cite you. Citation is is, is a really good, um, like, I'm really surprised. Like, I, 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 I post... I post the code for most most of my analyses. Um, I use a lot of um, uh, publicly available open data sets. The data is already out there, and a lot of people cite me just because of my analysis scripts. And it's the same sort of thing. If you're posting your open data, um, okay, people definitely have to cite you because they're using your data, and that is a reward in itself um, because that is one one measure that people do use for uh, for in terms of um, promotions and applying for new, new positions, etc. Thank you. Uh, there's another question from Leone. She's wondering uh, whether it's still possible to use synthetic data if you want to look at individual pathways as well. Uh, can you specify what you mean by individual pathways or potentially rephrase that? Is that like looking at things at an individual level? Um, because if you're looking at an individual level, it still is possible because essentially that synthetic person doesn't represent a real person so you can still even look individually and 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 explore that data individually but 
you're still not revealing the identity of the real individual. So hopefully I answered your question there. OK, thank you, uh, Leone. If you would like to expand on that, please do add your comments or questions in the chat. Uh, the next question is from uh, Christian. Uh, they're asking, will this synthop, uh, sorry, synthpop package will be able to work with repeated measures for patients such as registry type data? In principle, yes. This has been tested with, with repeated measures and it has, at least with the ones that I've tested it with, it has, this data has shown good general and specific utility, but of course every individual data set needs to be tested. But in, in, in principle, yes, yes, they, 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 this should work. Okay, thanks. I have some questions also from the room here. So there is actually there's two questions in one question. Uh, so what are some hurdles that make sharing data difficult and why can we not ask for this data without personal information in the first place? Uh, I think, so, I mean, there is te technical hurdles to, to, to doing it in some research fields. Um, especially if you're dealing with large data sets, it can be very difficult to, to share this raw data. I'm thinking of neuroimaging, for instance, um, and there's obvious privacy considerations as well. So that 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 that's one big hurdle. What was the second part of that question? Sorry. The, 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 the uh, second why part. Why can we not ask for this data without personal information? Uh, per personal permission from the from the participants. I mean, yes. we, we 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 can we, we we can we can try. We can do that. Um, so yeah, that that is a possibility, but sometimes we want to, this is a good way of actually thinking about research that you've already collected because getting retrospective consent is is, is quite a lot of work, um, but uh, that's one thing that we can at least try doing. Okay, thank you. I'm going back to the chat questions. So from uh, Cleveland, hi Dan, thank you for the talk. You mentioned that synthetic uh, uh, could not be used to publish in new paper separate from the original data. So can you expand on why this is the case, please? Um, I think it, because you're not dealing with real data. Like I said, the outcomes that you get with synthetic data versus original data, they're going to be in some cases, they're going to be the same, but in most cases, they're going to be very similar, but not the same. Um, maybe, maybe there are some situations in which you can say you can be very upfront and you can say this is a, this is synthetic data, so it doesn't necessarily represent um, real people. Uh, there has been some people that have explored using synthetic data as a way of doing machine learning. Machine learning needs huge data sets, so some people have proposed they get data off um, I don't know um, two hundred people, for instance, and then they create synthetic data. Uh, they they create they keep creating synthetic data sets of these people so that that that's one potential approach but because you're not dealing with real data unless you're very upfront with the fact that this is a synthetic data which may not actually represent real data then you may have some issues there but look if you're upfront then then perhaps it's a possibility but that's sort of that that that's why i say that you you can't necessarily publish a new paper based on this or in, in a traditional sense that is Okay, so I have a, my own question. So you you mentioned about using data, um, but I was just wondering again two questions: whether the same data set can be used endlessly, and if there is a point when a data set becomes outdated. Uh, are you kind of speaking of this idea of like salami salami slicing, or like or more sort of practical? On on a practical. Yeah, yeah I mean, you. Within the within the synthwap package, you can set different seeds. So some people are actually using this to create classroom assignments. <laughs> so what they're doing is so that people don't so that people don't um, get answers off their friends. Some people, some teachers are basically they create a seed based on a random num number generation. Every individual student gets a data set which is slightly different but very similar. So what that means is when they're reporting uh, assignments that um, the um, the marker can can has has the original key for the original data, and they can actually see whether the the, the student is understanding it because they're reporting because there's going to be differences in with a couple of decimal places. So that's one scenario where you, you can, in, in principle, depending on the size of the data set you create, you can create unlimited um, synthetic data sets based on one data set if the data set's large enough. That is, there are limits according to according if, if, if it's a small data set but if it's a larger data set in principle you, you create um, huge amounts of, of of synthetic data sets which share the same characteristics but just are just a little bit different 
Thank you. Um, yeah, you've also mentioned that the, the use of synthetic data sets is increasing, is increasing uh, uh, and the, the paper you referred to, I think the first was from 2016, so mm. now we're in 2022. Mm. So where do you think uh, we are in terms of using the data sets, synthetic data sets, and how we could improve? It's still quite small, so I kind of keep an eye on 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 people that are citing my paper in the original paper, and uh, a, a lot a lot of the citations are here's an example of what we can do. Um, very few papers are taking that step of actually of actually doing that. Um, I hope that by promoting it and by doing this tutorial paper, it'll it'll increase the usability of of, of doing this. Um, and look. Like I said, the best thing to do is just to post the open data if you can. This is an option of something that you can do if uh, if if posting um, if posting open data uh, isn't a possibility. So, I think, of course, the one thing is a, a technical hurdle, and hopefully we've we've gotten past that. Um, but it's also it's, it's also familiarity as well. A lot of people just simply aren't familiar with this, and and w when 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 an editor or when reviewers they're like, oh, what's 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 this? What's this synthetic? It's not real data. What 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 are we doing here? So part of it is merely just pr promotion, so that it actually this this concept gets gets a bit more heard. Yeah, okay. I'm 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 really happy that in a way we are adding to, to this promotion awareness of I hope so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there is one more question from the room. You have already touched on that, and so please let me know if you would like to add anything to that. Uh, so uh, the question is asking that since this is a workshop that encourages increasing reproducibility and promote open science, obviously this will take extra work. How do we incent incentivize people to be more open with their data set and how can this potential uh, potentially help researchers career development so you did mention the citation thing so if anything you would like to add uh yeah look i think i think you can help for your, for your careers um because more and more advertisements are now asking for demonstration of open science practices uh i've i've been on both sides of the table, so to speak, and a, a lot of people will they'll say, well, you yeah, know, this person says they're 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 very pro or positive open science, but they haven't actually demonstrated that they're, that they're doing this. So, by doing this kind of stuff, you will be in many institutions, you'll be at a distinct advantage compared to compared to other applicants, assuming that this is an important criteria. So one thing we can do is that we can um, we can uh, we can uh, lobby <laughs> essentially our institutions to make this a part or at least our departments or our faculties to make this a part of the evaluation process because this this will change behaviors and hopefully funders will will, will, will also change as well. Um, I know funders are a little bit hesitant to say um, uh, we have to have open data because a lot of research funders fund a broad range of projects. But I know some funders who, who are a lot more specific, who only fund hypothesis-driven medical research, then they can say, hey, like we we, we, we want researchers to demonstrate what they're doing uh, for open data. So this is just one way that researchers can can demonstrate if uh, even if I, if I can't get the permission of my participants to share my data, here is one here is one potential option one way that we can actually do this so that hopefully that can that can change change incentives but it's it's a lot of it is is, is grassroots it starts from the bottom it starts from people actually demonstrate i can I, I can do this stuff but it also has to come from the top down but i think we can work from work from both directions Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. That was so insightful and on so many aspects, on so many levels, like the individual, the university, external stakeholders, like founders, and so on. Uh, thanks very much again. Uh, this is very, it's, it's a very important talk, and I'm going to post it on YouTube on our account, by the way. Uh, if there are no questions, uh, we'll then uh, sum it up. And thanks everyone for your participation and very interesting questions. Dan, again, it's been a pleasure to have you. Um, um, and uh, yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you all. Nice to, nice to meet you all virtually. If you have any questions, please get in touch. Stop recording.